have a super duper awesome guest speaker with us here today. Christy Sands is the Vice President of Communications and Culture at Gallagher Bassett. So with that, Christy, I will hand it over to you to please share your screen and perhaps tell us a little bit more about yourself as well. Hello, everyone. Um, nice to see everybody. Thanks for jumping on camera. I'm always excited to see folks uh, engaged in sessions, especially one about communications where the whole thing is about engagement. So, so far off to a super duper start. Um, so thanks for joining us today. As Tendeka said, I uh, work for uh, an organization called Gallagher Bassett. We are part of the Gallagher organization, and I work for GB, which is the risk management segment, um, primarily claims, but also different segments of, of construction, um, specialty services like cyber, um, client services, just a wealth of, of things to do here at GB. So I'm very excited to be here, and thank you for taking the time to, uh, to let me in the door today and talk to you about communications. Um, so let's see if I can make this bad boy work. Okay, so um, just a little bit about my insurance path, and I would love to learn a little bit more about the people who are on the call. This is the group session where I ask you to throw something in the chat. So from what I understand, some of you are already in the industry, just joining the industry, and some of you may even be considering joining the insurance industry. So if you could throw into the chat, like why you're considering joining or what brought you to the industry, I would love to see it. And if you haven't joined the industry and you're still on the bubble, I would love to know what would tip the scales so that I can make sure that I address that stuff. Um, as far as, as my story, I joined the industry 32 years ago. I know that seems hard to believe. It's hard to believe every day. Um, but I joined the industry um, through a connection that I had through my family. Um, she was uh, she was in the industry, and my father said, well, look what Vilma has done. She's doing great in the insurance industry. Maybe you should give it a go. So I did. Um, the industry that I had chosen out of college was uh, news, and they were laying people off. So I was like, insurance, better. They're not laying people off. So off to insurance I went. Um, so I have been in the industry for 32 years. I have handled workers' compensation, liability, property claims. I have come up through Gallagher Bassett over the past 23 years, starting as a claims adjuster. Um, I managed a branch. Uh, I've handled a $10 million book of business as a client services manager and a producer. And about five years ago, I transitioned into marketing and communications. So I joined because it seemed like a great opportunity and I stay because the opportunities just keep coming. Um, so that is my pitch for being in insurance. It's a great place to be. Um, so with that, I would like to talk, uh, I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh. I don't know if you could see that up there, but it says Pitt somewhere up there. Um, as a communications major, communications has always been my most favorite thing. So I was hoping to share with this group today just a little about what I've learned about communications, some best practices on how you can be a better communicator as you join a corporation or as you grow within a corporation. So just some best practices and then maybe some resources at the end. And then if we have time, it's like ask Christy anything time, which gives me no anxiety whatsoever. Everything is fine. All right. All right, so traits of great communicators. You've probably learned about this or are currently learning about this, but just some really important things that you should know about being a good communicator and how that will help you get ahead in your career. Um, it seems counterintuitive, but really the number one thing that you can do is listen. <laughs> and it seems weird because you, I'm about to tell you a million ways that you can outwardly communicate, but the most important thing that you can do when entering into some kind of a communication situation before you speak or before you write is listen to the other person. Sometimes people in a conversation can get so caught up in what they'd like to say that they forget to listen, and then they don't really um, contribute anything meaningful to a conversation, no matter the medium. Another thing that I would share is to be clear and concise. A good communicator knows that you should always convey your message with as few words as possible. In other words, no word salad. You don't need to use a million syllables to get your point across. In fact, sometimes time and content 
actually dictate that you should use the simplest words possible to get your point across. Then go into depth where necessary, but otherwise just use good clear language in shorter bursts. Um, the third thing I would say is cultivate confidence, right? It doesn't do anybody any good if you're not confident in what you're saying. They might dismiss what you have as a great idea or something that you can contribute. And if you don't express it with confidence, you might not get the attention that you want, need, or deserve. So make sure that when you are communicating, whether it's in a situation like this or in person, that your body language presents um, well and it's key. Um, be, be sure that if you're doing something in a written format that your communication is solid and not mushy, like you could or you might. Um, you wanna actually take a pretty strong stance and be confident in what you're presenting. Um, the fourth tip I would say is use empathy, right? Know your audience, be empathetic, because then you understand the other person's point of view. There are times, and I know this is going to come as a shock to you, that you might actually disagree with somebody who's on the other end of a conversation. And that's okay. Like, discourse is fine. Um, just when you, when you think about what the other person is saying, rather than being judgmental, be curious. If there's any Ted Lasso fans out there, um, you know, be, be curious, not judgmental. Listen to what the other person has to say, consider their point of view, and, um, and then know what their pain point is or what's bringing them to the table, and then figure out your opportunity to offer value. And then the last uh, thing on this slide that we'll talk about is being self-aware. So the best communicators are the ones who are aware of their contributions and how to um, better manage the flow of dialogue. So talking for the sake of talking isn't great. Um, also, if there is another person sitting at the table, somebody, your junior even, you know, if their skill set is one that should be highlighted, give them the floor, introduce them, lend your credibility to them. And conversely, if you are the more junior person, ally yourself with someone else at the table who might have a little bit more experience and has, um, has some kind of pull in the organization and tell them what your idea is, maybe a pre-wire and then have them introduce you. And, um, and that's how you can better get a seat at the table. Are there any questions about that? That was a lot. And I just said to be self-aware. So I'm gonna take a pause here and see if there are any questions, knowing that my screen is super duper small and I might need some help with that. No? Hey, Christy, yeah. it's your colleague, Karen. How are you? Hello, Karen Siebert. <laughs> I, I had just put into the chat. Sorry, it's early in California. Um, I had just put into the chat that I love what you had said. Like, if somebody brings up an idea and then there's somebody else in the room who then brings up that same idea a few minutes later, you're like, hey, what about me? Am I chop lover? It's like, oh, so I'm looking at the screen here. Um, Karen Siani, that was a great idea. But, you know, I think Fu Yao just said that a few minutes ago. Maybe you two could work on that. Like, get others to acknowledge it because maybe they didn't articulate it the right way and it didn't come across. So I love what you just said about that. Exactly right. And Karen, you're always a great example of that. You're always uh, the first person to to champion others at the table. So, I mean, like if I could put like a subtweet on here, I would say find yourself a Karen Siebert. Um, but I don't know that everybody has that. But like if you can find one, get one. I highly recommend them. They don't they come in lots of shapes. Um, but th this this flavor of Karen is my favorite. So thank you, Karen. All right. So um, there are kind of three things that we're going to talk about today that I would love to make sure that we get across when it comes to actual communications in the workplace. So let's talk about audience. Generally, these are the folks that you're going to be communicating with, right? Managers and leadership, clients and business partners, and then peer to peer. Um, so how we communicate depends on the audience we're trying to reach. So as you prepare any type of communication, always, always have your audience in mind, because this will help you determine the medium, the structure, and the tone of your email or your presentation. And it also helps me as a communicator figure out what I want those people to either know, feel, and or do following my communication. So if you are addressing a manager or a leader and you're trying to get across um, a new uh, program that you would like to start and you need the buy-in, well then know what you want them to know about what you're doing, how you want them to feel, and what you want them to do, the action you want them to take. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get into medium best practices. Now, since I'm in claims, I feel inclined to throw in a bunch of caveats and it depends. So like roll with me, insurance is always funny. And so I like to give warnings and like best practice ideas to keep you all safe. So here is my first caveat to take into consideration when you're communicating, even peer to peer, always remain professional because as we all know in the insurance industry, any communication that circulates in the course of business is what we like to call discoverable. Um, a lot of organizations have uh, reten uh, records retention things. So anything that you put in an email, in a message, anywhere really, um, it, it could be discoverable. So if you're embarrassed to see it in front of a judge or your grandma, don't put it in writing, all right? Like that is my strongest piece of advice ever. You never wanna see something coming back that maybe didn't reflect your intention. Um, so when you're communicating with leadership, um, and I'll put this in the chat, I'll put a link in the chat, we've always found it pretty successful to use something called the pyramid principle. Um, leaders really have a lot going on and a lot of plates spinning, and they have uh, what, what we'll call time poverty, right? They need you to get right to the point. So when you're communicating with a leader and considering your audience, start with the answer first, group and summarize your supporting arguments, and then logically support your ideas. And the reason you do it this way is because a lot of times, if your idea is one that they've already thought about or considered, then you might get the buy-in at the very top of whatever communication you're doing. You'll also lose them if you don't. It's always really great to tell a story and heck, I'll probably share a few stories today, but start with the answer first and the most important thing in, that you have and get that across because if they stop reading, you at least want them to know why you came. Um, regarding your objectives, be clear in your own mind about what you're trying to achieve in your communication, even at the peer-to-peer -peer level. Because people have time poverty, like I know our claims people have a lot of time deadlines. For example, they have to make contact with the claimant the uh, the or injured worker the client, a doctor's office, or maybe two or three, all within 24 hours. So when I am getting in front of folks who have time poverty, I like to make sure that they know exactly why I'm approaching them. The more clear you are about asking what you want, the better chance you have of getting a reply or the result you're trying to achieve. And then medium. So we'll go over that next, but I just want to, again, another caveat for you. Um, some advice about informal media and your activity on them. This is not gonna be like Auntie Christy talking to you about your behavior on um, social media. That's a whole other brand discussion. Um, but let's talk about the use of like iMessage or WhatsApp in the course of business. Um, a lot of organizations, again, have retention policy and rules about what communication channels are acceptable for doing business. So they, can specifically, like the Gallagher organization does, prohibit using third-party apps like iMessage or WhatsApp. Um, and then just know that if you do use them and it's known, again, those exchanges could be subject to your employer's record retention policy. Those are very casual ways of communicating. So again, be mindful of how you're communicating in the course of business. And if you can separate your personal out from your professional, then you probably will stay away from some bad waters. Are there any questions about this slide at all or any of the stuff that I've shared so far, knowing that I can't see and that I'm gonna beg for somebody to just say something? <laughs> no? All right. No, nope, not yet. That's fantastic advice though. Thank you. Thank you for sharing all I'm of this. I'm trying to keep you all out of trouble. That's, I'm just we a mom. We appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, all right. So. What I'd love to do is go over some commonly used mediums and share some best practices I've seen through my education and then through my years of practice and experience. Your future or current employer might use some other programs. For example, at Gallagher um, and Gallagher Bassett, we use uh, Microsoft Teams, but some other organizations may use Slack or other channels, or um, they may even use channels I'm referring to in a different way. So I would recommend that we're gonna go over these things. These are very general, but always go back to what the norms are in the organization that you are joining or are at. 
So hopefully something you learn at the time you're onboarded, um, they'll tell you what the communication norms are and what the expectations are. But if it's not clear or you're afraid you're gonna step in it, it does not hurt to ask your manager and some trusted colleagues about how they prefer to communicate and then let them know your preferences as well. A lot of times that you'll find an organization will publicize kind of their communication norms. Get your hands on those and ask for them if you don't get them right away. So I'm starting with email. I was gonna start with like least, least time intensive to most time intensive, but I decided to start with email because email is the single most popular way to communicate in corporate USA. Um, in fact, most of the communication that we see about 40%, when you think about all the different channels where you can communicate, 40% sits squarely in email. And another thing that's really interesting, when you look at kind of the numbers from a communication professional standpoint, if I send out an email with a distinct message, a one, one message gig, if you will, about one topic, announcing a new person to the organization, announcing new policy, upwards of 90% of the people who get that email will open it read it, interact with it, and do something about it, um, as opposed to a smaller, like a team meeting or um, a phone call or something like that. So I've chosen to give you some email best practices right off the top, because I feel like this is probably the one that's going to help you the most, and probably the one that I've messed up more than any, if I'm being totally honest. So um, if you can avoid mistakes by learning from my mistakes, um, I would be delighted to help you along. So the first thing that we've learned both internally and even externally when it comes to email marketing is a descriptive subject line and any action required in that subject line is most welcome. I know that when I'm looking through my emails and trying to use internal tools to sort what should come first and second in the way of uh, priority for me, the first thing I'm going to look for is a subject line that catches my eye and is important to me as the recipient of that email, and if there's a deadline in the subject of the email. So for example, I just sent an email out to the senior level claims leaders seeking content for a newsletter, and I asked them for specifically a success story from a claims team, and I need it by July 13th, abundantly clear of what my expectation is from them. Now, once I put that out in the universe, I'm hoping that they will come back to me with the content. Um, but it was right up front what my expectations are and what I am looking for from them so they can uh, prior, uh, prioritize it in their day, week, month. Um, share your intent and your required action in the first two lines. I got an email from someone over the weekend, yes, over the weekend, on a Sunday, on a holiday weekend. That's a norm we can discuss later. No bueno. Um, but sh sh this individual sent me a very long email and I read it two to three times. And I still, to this moment, don't understand what the point of that email was. There were many, many words all in a row. They were very nice words. But at the end of that email, I did not know what action I was supposed to take, if she required a response at any given time. Um, and if I was supposed to do anything to either help her, was it an FYI, or is it something that she needed me to do for her at all? Um, there, are, there are circumstances where you will find yourself forwarding an email, like maybe that long and winding road that I received, because somebody else could address it. If you plan on doing that, make sure that you, one, notify the person who sent you the original email, but also provide the necessary context about why you are sending that email along. So for example, Karen and I serve on a steering committee for diversity and inclusion at Gallagher Bassett. Karen um, is amazing and does all of the um, corporate social responsibility piece of diversity and inclusion at Gallagher Bassett. Christy, superstar, I do all the awareness and education. So uh, she does all the hard work and I deliver all the good news. Let me tell you, it's a dream relationship every single time. Um, but sometimes someone will reach out to me and say, hey, I have an opportunity for a sponsorship. Um, can you please help me? And what I do is I will forward it to Karen with a copy to the person who sent it to me and say, hey, Karen, this seems like something that falls under your pillar of 
of uh, included GB or diversity and inclusion. Um, if you could please reply to them and then I let them know if I still need to be included or if you can just drop me off the string because I don't have anything to contribute but provide necessary context immediately. Ring communication makes it hard to interpret somebody's tone. Jokes don't land in email, people. I will tell you every single time. You can be funny, you can be um, humorous, and you can have a sense of humor at work, but chances are if you're doing it over email, probably not gonna land. So just watch your tone and be mindful of how any comment you give in an email will land with the recipient or the recipient's recipient or that judge I was talking about or your grandmother. And then sending emails to only relevant individuals. Y'all, um, there is a really, really bad, bad, bad button on your email platform like Outlook that says reply all. Don't do it. If you're tempted to reply all, just be very careful about how you do it. Um, but I will tell you this, you can send emails to only relevant individuals by using the designation that Outlook gives you. So if you're putting somebody in the two line, generally it's the people who are required to take action. And again, what are they required to do? Give them the action item or tell them, hey, I'm making this an FYI. You can carbon copy people to keep them informed, but not required to take any action. And then Blind carbon copy, it's a little bit of quicksand that I'll warn you about. Blind carbon copy is if you want to send it to, let's say a whole entire listicle of people, um, and you wanna protect the privacy of the recipients. Where blind carbon copy can go wrong is if you are specifically excluding people from an email because it doesn't apply to them. And then all of a sudden, somebody has forwarded your BCC and they are not on the email and it just creates a lot of churn about why they weren't on the email to begin with. We'll talk about the use of something like Teams for, for those kind of conversations. Just know that some people don't understand that they've been CC'd, been blind carbon copied, BCC'd, and might forward your email. So just use that very, very judici judiciously, if at all. Are there any questions about email? I'm super passionate about it. I, I, I even have like this really cool, I wanted to show you guys, so this is my this is my office decoration. It says per my last email. This is how you know that you spent too much time on email and not raising your children because my daughter made this for me. So, <laughs> uh, Christy, I know you probably can't see the chat, but a few people are talking about the um, BCC burn. You know where oh, yeah. then the person hits reply and nobody knew they were BCC. So there's a bunch of thumbs up on that one too. Yes, thank you, Karen. You know, one day I'm going to learn how to use Zoom. We'll talk about that in video conferencing. But thank you. <laughs> thank you for the assist, Karen. I'm forever grateful. <laughs> so yeah, don't get burned by BCC. I hate it for you. And I would hate to hear that it happened to you. But it's happened to me before. And um, it was not great. So all right. Let's talk about phone calls or uh, video conferences best practices. So um, I'm a big fan of phone calls. And uh, I would like to say that, you know, when you go from email and there's more than three emails back and forth on any given subject, my rule of thumb, and when I was um, managing my team of uh, resolution managers, which is what GB calls claims adjusters, or when I had direct reports under me and client services, if I got more than three emails on one subject, I called someone <laughs> because, the email wasn't doing its job. Either, either my email wasn't coming across in the way that I needed it to, or the person's response wasn't clear to me. But either way, let's cut through it. 15 emails isn't helping anyone. It's a big drain on resources. At some point, you're going to have to pick up the phone. So um, best time to use a phone call or um, a video call in, in the case of like MS Teams is where context can be lost through the written word or if issues can be resolved more quickly through a live conversation. Again, I'll pick on poor Karen. Um, thankfully, Karen is like three hours behind me. I'm East Coast, she's California. So um, if there's been emails going back and forth about that issue for diversity and inclusion, I can pick up the phone and call her and say, hey, did you get were you clear on this? I wasn't clear on it. Let's talk it through. And then as a courtesy, one of us, whoever comes up with the idea, will just circle back and close out the email with this is where we landed and close the loop on the email string. 
But the best time to use that telephone call is when you anticipate a big number of questions about information you're sharing. So for example, I used to have someone who reported to me in client services. He was great, great at data and storytelling with his data. Um, and he would put together these beautiful, magnificent reports for the client who would look at them and not understand a word, not understand why she was getting them um, and would just shoot back a message like, I don't get it. Um, this individual's modus of operandi is that he would prefer to send another email with the clarification. And my advice to him was, don't, she didn't get it. You need to stop what you're doing, set a call with her, or pick up the phone and walk her through it. Um, that could be the difference between a client whose hair is on fire or a client who is over the moon and delighted with your service and is going to send an email to the CEO about how perfectly fabulous you are. So if you have something that there's, you anticipate a lot of questions, be prepared for a phone call. There are times where you're going to be sharing or discussing a sensitive subject. As you grow into leaders in the insurance industry, um, you might be discussing sensitive subjects, HR type subjects, um, client information that you cannot put into an email because of record retention and, and that sensitive discussion that you need to have. Um, you should plan to use a phone call for stuff like that. Um, if you are not getting a response via email, try a phone call. Um, or if the topic is really urgent, e.g. my CEO is asking me for this and I need a resolution right now, it's best to pick up the phone and call someone. If you do decide to do a video call like the one we're on, I would strongly recommend dress in business or business casual attire. Be ready. You don't have to, you don't have to get ready if you stay ready. Um, so if you do report and show up for something, be camera on, dress in business or casual attire, simplify your background to um, minimize distractions. So you'll see behind me, I have a wall that kind of represents who I am. I live in Florida, I went to Pitt, I love Hamilton. If you wanna talk about any of those things, let me know. Um, but your, your organization may also have branded backgrounds or blurred backgrounds to minimize distractions behind you. Tandeka, I see a hand, I see your hand yes, up. Yes, okay. so we have a question that is in the chat. So it's from Tiffany Lee. She Hello, says- Tiffany. Yeah, she says, I've heard in some industries, the order in which you include people in the line, in the CC line, is important. Do we have uh, such rules within the insurance industry? So what are your thoughts on the order of the people listed in the CC line? That is a wonderful, really, really great question. And I don't know that there is a rule but I will tell you when I am sending an email, I, I, I do awards for Gallagher Bassett. It's the best part of my job is I get to nominate our people and our processes for awards. And part of my job is to announce the awards to the people at the top in the C-suite. And I promise you that the very first person I put is Scott Hudson, our global CEO and president. The second person I put is Mike Hessling, our CEO of North America. And then the third person I put is, let's say our executive vice president, senior level vice presidents. I'd like to put them in that order simply because it, it's a hierarchical part of the organization. Um, I try to put the most senior level person first, just as a good matter of practice. And if we're being honest, politics, right? Like it, people will understand if you put the most senior person first. Fantastic, thank you. Awesome. MS Teams. Um, all right, so how do you use MS Teams? So if you are just graduating from high school, you're in college, um, I know that over the pandemic, we used MS Teams for my son's high school classes. And then we had, we also rolled them out at Gallagher at a very similar time. So Luke and I were both learning, uh, Luke's my son, we were both learning to use Teams at the same time. And I have to say he did much better than I did, but that's okay. Um, he, he used it eight hours a day and I used it six. So he got a lot more repetition. But just some meeting um, and MS Teams uh, best practice, some MS Teams best practices. Um, respect your colleagues' availability. Um, like for example, right now, um, on Teams, it should show that I am on red with a little white line through it, which means I'm presenting. So the last thing I want to see is 
something coming up, um, you know, with a note that's going to flash onto my screen that somebody's trying to send me a note on Teams, um, especially if it's on Teams and it could be very casual. Um, I certainly wouldn't want everybody on this call to see somebody sending me a GIF of what they did this weekend that has a dog eating you know, a dog eating a hot dog, let's say. And while that would be entertaining, if I were on with, let's say, Scott Hudson, our global CEO, might not come across as the most professional thing. So make sure that you respect other people's availability status. And if they're unavailable, try not to ping them. Maybe send an email and they'll see it asynchronously when it's convenient for them. Um, and then set your availability status accordingly. Um, if you're away, be away. Like do yourself that favor. If you're setting yourself a boundary, um, make sure that, that everybody knows that you are not available and that you're not going to respond immediately, especially on teams where it's like people are expecting you to respond back rather quickly. It is a place for short, concise messages that invite an immediate response. Like, did you get a response from Kapil today about the client connect? No, I have not. Please reach out to him. That's the extent of the conversation. Um, make your message clear. If I get something on Teams and it's just, hi, I'm leaving them on red, you guys. I'm leaving them on red every single time. So do yourself a favor. If Unless you really just want to say hi to that person, make your message clear. Hi, Christy, can I have a moment of your time to talk about the Claims Operation Recognition Program? I have a great idea on how to celebrate the win. Now I know what this person needs. Now I can respond back and say, hey, that sounds great. I have, I'm on calls for the next 30, but I'll call you at the top of the hour, right? And then everybody knows that we've accepted each other, but just a hi, I'm leaving you on red. I'm just gonna tell you that. Um, make your message clear. If you do acknowledge the receipt, if it does look urgent and you can't get to it right away, do respond or use an emoji like a thumbs up or something, just, just kind of close out the loop. If you're bringing people into a conversation that's already existing, put their name in. So, so I'll go back to our DEI committee. We have people that handle the um, career progression track and our mentorship program. We've got Karen over here doing stuff. We've got Christy over here doing stuff. Um, but if I need a response from somebody, say about an agenda item, I will at them so that it will ping to the top of their box, letting them know that I need to know an answer from them for the organization. Um, if you have a chat, sometimes it's nice to name your group chat so people can find it more quickly. Um, I'm, I'm doing something for um, the Workers' Comp Conference in the state of Florida. I am managing Give Kids the World. That's our um, that that's how we are um, giving back to the community in August. And I have a whole bunch of people who are interested in coming, and they all want to know what to wear. Well, I'm going to name what to wear at Give Kids the World so that people can just go back to that chat and they can find it very simply. And then use the search functions to find anything that you need. There's about a million other best practices I can give you in MS Teams, but does anybody have any questions about MS Teams in particular? Cool, cool, cool. All right. Meetings. I don't know about you, but meetings, there's a lot. Um, you've, got, you've got two options of being in a meeting. You can either be an attendee or an owner. Um, which are you going to be? We're going to kind of go through some best practices. Um, so if you're the meeting owner, you are now setting a meeting, particularly you know, at, at your level um, in the organization, you want to be very mindful of these rules, create good boundaries for people, healthful boundaries, because a lot of times people who are senior to you in the organization are going to have meetings scheduled from 8 a.m. until sometimes 7 or 8 p.m. Um, so be mindful of people's times. And if you can, build in a five minute bio break at the top or bottom of an hour, um, just so people can go and get their cute little water or they can run to the restroom or go grab a power bar or something in between meetings. But if you've got leaders who are on marathon meetings, you want their attention, give them a chance to be fully present. Begin and end your meetings on time. Tendeka did a great job. She started the meeting on time. Everybody was here. And I, I got to hold up my end of the bargain and end the meeting on time. Um, be, be mindful of that because, again, people might be jumping from meetings to meetings. And they also, I mean, I keep my little notepad here of like my little takeaways of 
things. Um, I want to be able to synthesize those and um, and and be ready for my next meeting. If I have to look at something, I, I like a little time in between. So always be careful about starting and stopping your meetings. Um, nothing will burn an executive more aside from a BCC is if you schedule a meeting that they absolutely have to be at and they're, all set, they're already triple booked. <laughs> Um, so just look at calendar availability. I know in Teams, there's a way you can look at schedule. In Outlook, you can look at people's schedules if you're on that. And if not, before you set a meeting, figure out who the people are that absolutely need to contribute to your meeting and get their availability and do your best to set a time when the most of them can be available. Provide an agenda. Now, there are people who will set very strong boundaries and not show up to a meeting unless there's an agenda. That is a flex. Um, I haven't seen it work every single time, but as a meeting owner, it, it's great for you to send things to your meeting participants that lays out what's going to be discussed, what decisions or actions will need to be taken, and then at the end of the meeting, just go through the agenda and close it out, making sure you hit all your points, or talk about when you will address them the next time. Send your pre-readings in advance. If you have something that everyone needs to look at beforehand, this is an Amazon uh, trick. They send out a memo beforehand and the expectation is people are going to read it before they go to the meeting. Um, so if you do have uh, an article, for example, Karen sent out, I think a, a PowerPoint um, for our meeting today about um, uh, diversity in the generations that we're probably going to talk at, at, at a little bit of length about in our Steerco meeting this afternoon. I'm going to read that in advance, right? So I'm grateful that she sent it to me and I'm going to do her the courtesy of reading it. And then also follow up your meetings with a recap, next steps, any resources that people need, including what, uh, who's responsible and target dates for response and completion. If you're an attendee, please RSVP. I don't know if you know, but it's a short weekend for a lot of us right now in the, these United States of America. I have a meeting this afternoon. I'm getting all kinds of out of offices that I've sent to people that, you know, are you attending the meeting today? I don't know if they're attending or not. I don't know if I'm gonna have quorum. So good hygiene, RSVP timely to the meeting invitations. And if you cannot attend, change your RSVP so that the, the, the meeting owner knows that you won't be attending. Tandeka. Yes, I've got another question in from Tiffany Lee. Uh, so Tiffany is asking if a meeting organizer doesn't send an agenda beforehand or a recap with next steps after, what are ways to nudge the meeting owner? And is that something that I should step up and volunteer to do? Or is that just an extra unrecognized responsibility? Oh, that is... That's, that's a landmine of questions. Okay, great. Um, Tiffany, that really is a, a fantastic question, especially because you don't want to do uh, the work of other people and sometimes maybe even step in it or overstep by doing somebody else's gig and possibly damage a relationship. So I would say that if you walk away from a meeting and you don't or are not clear on next steps or don't get that, it is perfectly appropriate to either pick up the phone or send an email right, to have that kind of point of reference to say, thank you so much for including me in the meeting today. I had taken some notes, but I wasn't exactly clear on what my particular takeaway was or what the, you know, anything big that I should keep in mind. Here's what I took. Am I missing anything? So for your own personal, you know, get, get what you're responsible for, for sure, so that you can make sure that you show up for the next meeting prepared. Um, this could prompt somebody else to do it. Um, if people are reaching out to you saying, I have no idea what I was supposed to do, you could say, you know, we were talking after the meeting and uh, just wanted to make sure we were all clear on our takeaways and that could prompt them to send something out. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and just another thing about uh, meetings. So recently, um, we just got at Gallagher avatars. So this is something that that MS Teams uh, or Microsoft has rolled out, or you can create avatars. I was going to show you my avatar, but she's she's not ready for prime time yet. Um, but just a note about using like avatars in meetings and GIFs and emojis. Um, there might be a time to use an avatar or a GIF and an emoji 
but you should be cautious on how they reflect on the message you're delivering and what you're trying to achieve, right? So just kind of a good rule of thumb that we're gonna be sharing within our organization is if you are having client facing meetings like claim reviews or round tables or um, virtual partnership meetings or places where you're interacting with a client or broker or an actuary, like somebody that, that kind of has a stake in what you're doing, probably not best to use an avatar. I think you show up like this, right? You show up in business or business casual, face forward and prepared. Um, ditto business partner meetings. Um, I, I don't know if you all saw the cat, uh, with the, the, the attorney that showed up as a cat in front of a hearing. I don't think he meant to, um, but I certainly don't think that the judge um, was real impressed with his case and he probably didn't win, um, but, your avatar takes the place of you. So if you're going to be in a meeting with broker partners, legal counsel, judges, medical providers, anybody who um, who you're looking for something for and need to interact with on a professional basis, best to leave the avatar out of it. And then if you're in it, uh, if you're a if you work with claimants, definitely do not show up to a phone call with a claimant um, as your avatar. So times where it could be appropriate, if the meeting planner says, hey, this is an avatar meeting because they're trying to do something fun or different, sure, show up with an avatar. Um, if a meeting planner says, you know, send a GIF of what you did this weekend, send the GIF, send the emoji. Um, if it's a team meeting where it's, a, you know, you feel psychologically safe and you have the kind of relationships where you can send happy smiley faces, fire emojis, that type of stuff, go for it. Um, but if you're questioning it, maybe hold back and, and hold off on it. Hannah has her hand up because I can see it. Hannah, how can I help you? No, thank you so much for all this advice. It's really helpful. Um, kind of going back to emails and messages and also Tiffany's question on like when, um, how to present yourself and like how to ask for what you really want. Um, I was wondering how you would advise um, expressing a sense of urgency for people who aren't responding to your emails um, without sounding impatient or rude. I don't know if you have any tips on wording or anything like that. Sure. Um, great question. And definitely something that, uh, as you have, as you have pointed out, could get you in a little bit of hot water or come across as rude. Um, I think that, you know, going back to, and I can go back to that slide, but if you set the expectation of when you are expecting or needing a reply, it is perfectly acceptable and reasonable to resend your email with a, just putting this at the top of your email box. Um, I need a, re a reply today. Um, if you could please let me know. And if you still don't hear from them, that's when I would pick up the phone and call. Um, as far as coming across as rude, that, that is tricky also, but if you're being direct and you were clear at the beginning of why you needed that back in the first place, I don't think you're running into any hot water. Um, don't insult them by any means. Like you never get back to me on time. That's a bad look, but a good look would be, I understand that you probably have a quite the busy schedule. However, in order for me to move our project forward, I need this from you today. Um, if you're not able to get it to me today, please give me a call so we can talk through the repercussions and I can um, you know, figure out next steps with you directly. Um, yeah. Open up the conversation because like I said, always be curious um, you know, in, in full disclosure. And I was talking to Tandeka before everybody came on. My family had some health problems from April until, I don't know, yesterday. So I was a little behind on my emails and I had people reach out to me and say, hey, I needed this from you. And immediately I was like, I am so sorry. I am at the hospital with my father. Let me connect you with Emma. So I did. I apologized. And I said, you know, thanks for reaching out. They were very gracious and said, I'm so sorry to hear that. I can, can I get it tomorrow? And I was like, absolutely. So that kind of like empathy, but also directness and clarity about what you need is the right way to approach it. And again, be kind, but also be firm about your deadlines. It doesn't hurt to like give yourself a couple of days <laughs> on either side of a deadline so that you don't uh, you don't end up in a bad place. But that's a whole it's a whole other upward management situation. Thank you. My pleasure. Great question. Right. Any other questions so far? 
All right. So when do you when do you employ these methods? This is uh, always a lot of fun. So this is a, a great little chart that I found in uh, HBR magazine. I do love HBR. Um, that's Harvard Business Review. I couldn't afford to go to Harvard. I couldn't probably get into Harvard, but I can read their magazine and take all the good stuff from it. So a good rule of thumb is thinking about before you start emailing everyone and their goat smelling mother about things, maybe fit, sit and think about whether or not you should be communicating outwardly. So the first thing you think is, have I thought through this situation? And if the answer is no, like have a think, get out a notebook, write down what you're, what you're trying to accomplish. What are your objectives if you wanna reach out to someone? Do you need outside input to make the progress? If the answer is yes, then think about the next steps. But if you can tackle this work yourself, do the work, just do the work. Um, if a real-time conversation um, needs to be, maybe start the conversation with the email, with the rules that I presented early. Clearly state what you're seeking the other person's information for, ask them if they have time to discuss and determine the next steps. Does it necessitate a face-to-face -face meeting? If no, maybe use chat, carry it on via email, or just you know have a, a, a video conference. And if you need a, an in-person meeting, right, because you need to have certain people at the table and you want to get it done and you want to have them in a face-to-face -face place, schedule and prepare for the meeting. So, um, like I said, there are some really great resources that you have to be a great communicator to your organization. First, check and see if there's anything that exists in the place where you are about the norms and how you communicate. Like I said, at Gallagher, we do have some norms about when to send emails, um, how to react. You've seen a lot of them today. Um, find a trusted colleague and ask if you think that you might be stepping in it, similar to what Hannah just did. Like, is, do you think I should reach out to this person? I can't tell you how many times somebody will consult me and say, you've worked with Karen before. How do you think she would react if I reached out this way? And then you give your best advice. Um, HBR Magazine, and I can send these out in links, but these are some really good um, really good articles on how great leaders communicate. You heard a little bit about them at the beginning of our session. And also the secret to a good meeting is preparation. Um, meeting prep is a, is a meeting in its own. And, um, but, but I will tell you that preparing for the meeting will get you off on a good foot when it comes to communicating what you need and getting back what you need. Um, Nancy Duarte is a communicator. She has written several really good books about um, communicating. I particularly like her book, uh, Data Story, when it talks about preparing conversations with leadership. And we talked a little bit about kind of the structure of how you would communicate with a leader, start at the top, and then bring your cascading points and your supporting underneath it. She does a really great job of talking about why you would communicate that way and also um, the right way to do it. And then resonate. There are times we're sharing a story, like my wayward colleague who sent me the word salad email. Um, that is a great time to take storytelling and, and talk about how it, um, you know, moves your story forward. Um, the principle, uh, the pyramid principle, I have a link to that. And then just like shameless plug, um, we, uh, we are an award-winning, uh, our internship program here at Gallagher. Um, has won the RISE Award for internship programs. So if you're in the market for an internship or interested in learning a little bit more about Gallagher Bassett, our CEO, Mike Hessling, did a really, really great keynote where he talks about what he's learned about the insurance industry. So if you're flirting with the idea of being in insurance or flirting with the idea of coming into claims or would just like to hear a really great leader speak about his insurance journey, I highly recommend checking out Mike Hessling's keynote. It was a barn burner and I was really, really proud to, uh, to be there and witness it. And I would strongly recommend, uh, it's a good use of, I think it was about 10 minutes and it's a great use of your time to find out a little bit more about leadership in the uh, in the industry so um ask me oh now i can see everybody's chat i love it all right so is there anything i can answer for anybody i'm trying to get over to the screen questions so i'm looking at why people are thinking of joining um it's a good income and i think i'll like it Okay, I guarantee you that it is probably the best job that you'll ever love. There, is, there are so many opportunities in insurance. I have handled claims for airlines, 
public sector clients like police and fire, I have learned about the craziest things that you'll ever find out about what chalices at a church are worth after a hurricane. I mean, you can learn a lot of really crazy wild things from being an in insurance because we touch everything. Um, job security. Yeah, I mean, Pat Gallagher will tell you that, uh, you know, insurance touches everything. Um, and there's there's great opportunities, whether you join claims or do the actuarial underwriting, um, whatever fuels your passion, you, you can probably find a spot for it. There are a ton of opportunities. So there is a question that popped in on the chat. Um, so Tiffany asks, do you have any tips on in-person communication at happy hours, networking events, etc.? topics to discuss or not discuss? And how do you remember people after the events? <laughs> I don't know. I, Karen, Karen and I might need to tag team this one. Um, so in-person in, in communication at happy hours and networking events. So I would say the first person is you're there for the first tip I would give you is you're there for a reason, right? No need to hug the walls. Um, make sure that you're out there. And, you know, if you know who's going in advance, maybe check out who's going in case there's somebody that you particularly would like to meet. Um, I was at a business insurance event um, the other week, and uh, there was one person there who had kind of influence over uh, the awards who I'd never met and I'd been trying to get in front of for a while. And it was kind of like nailing Jello to a wall. So I made sure that when I saw his name on the list that I sought him out and you know walked up and introduced myself and uh, let him know that I would love to strike up a conversation with him about this particular award that we would like to get some more advice on. So I would say if you have access to who is attending in advance, it's always great to prepare yourself for who it's going to be. Um, Happy hours, be professional. <laughs> Sometimes they serve alcohol at those things, people. There's no need to make it into a burn burner. Be professional, um, you know, and, and be comfortable. Don't feel pressure to do anything that you wouldn't do, um, but be friendly and um, definitely try to work the room. As far as topics to discuss or not discuss, I think, uh, Karen, maybe you want to help me out with this one. I think it's very safe to talk about your organization, the great things you're doing, why you're happy and excited to be there and ask the other person, you know, kind of what they're up to and what they can share and find out something you have in common with them. Um, not discuss. I, I'd stay away from the hot button topics that you can imagine. Um, anything super provocative. Um, I, I don't like to go out on a limb, especially if it's the first time I'm meeting people. It's really more for me to get to know them better and how to remember them after the event. I mean, there's there's a million different ways. Um, I always try to attach what I spoke to them about and then follow up with a quick email at the, at the conclusion of the event or connect with them on LinkedIn and talk about like, hey, you know, hey, Angela Taylor, it was really great to meet you at the blah, blah, blah social event the other day. I really enjoyed our conversation about golden doodles. And that way, when I go back and I look at my what emails or what communication have I sent to her, I can go back and say, oh, yes, Angela and I had a great conversation about a golden doodle that drooled all over her really best business suit right before a job interview. And then that's how I remember. Karen, I don't know if you yeah, have any yeah. tips. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna jump in. I love, I love what you just said, Christy. I think you hit it spot on. Um, I would just add two things. Number one, uh, which is people connect more with people who are interesting and seem interested in them. So don't get into a whole discussion about only yourself, because again, it's like, okay, great. You know, tell me a little bit about yourself, but it's also more about you being interested in them and how are you an interesting person? How do you connect? The second thing I was going to say is like Nicole is on the line, for example, right now, or Tendeka. We were at an event recently and let's say that we're in a circle of people and I don't know, I've never met Angela, for example, who, who Christy just pointed out. So you could say, hey, um, you know, Tendeka, have you guys met each other? And so then Tendeka says, oh no, hi, I'm Tendeka. And you say, oh, I'm Angela. Now I know Angela's name without having to say, who are you, right? So there's a little cheat in there but it's a good way for you to get to know a person or maybe you had that like brain fart moment where you forgot that person's name for a second and you're like, 
oh my god Angela it's so good to see you Nicole you were so great on the stage um and then the other person will uh, introduce themselves by their name and then nobody's on to the fact that you didn't remember that third person that's really a great point. And, and one other thing that, that you said, Karen, and I think about diversity and inclusion and belonging and the, or, you know, when you're at a conference, sometimes you'll see somebody's name on a badge and you won't know how to pronounce it. Um, it is perfectly acceptable to like introduce yourself, extend your hand, even though your name's right here, Christy. Um, hi, I'm Christy Sands and you are, you know, and let them say their name so that you can address them by their name. And there is nothing more respectful that you can do in a room than to call somebody by their name the way that they prefer to have it said um, and maybe not take a guess. So um, that's just yeah. one other tip I would say. Hi, Nicole, nice to see you. Um, all right. Very nice to see you. Um, Nicole absolutely just did such a great job the last time I saw her, it's so good. Um, okay, so um, we got two minutes left. So Tandeka, I don't know if you have any yeah. um, wrap up housekeeping stuff you need to end with, but thank yeah. you everyone. My pleasure, um, Karen, appreciate the assist, my sister. And um, looking forward to hearing about everybody's success. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn, find me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christy and Karen for being here. Thank you for bringing a sign language interpreter as well. That was absolutely amazing. So yeah, thank you all awesome. for being here today. So um, as you all know, we do these sessions weekly during the summer. So next week's session is going to be on Thursday, July 13th from 1 to 2 Eastern. Our presenting companies will be Morgan Stanley, and JP West, and we are going to learn all about networking and how to do it successfully. So I think that question that came up at the end is absolutely timely. So we'll have a full session on that next week. If you're not quite sure how to sign up, check out our website, go to the resources tab and register for all of our upcoming webinars. So thank you all for being here today and catch you next week. Have a good one.